Good morning, everyone. Let's call to order the March 7th meeting of the Regional Transportation Commission. Can I have a roll call, please? Commissioner Peterson. Here. Commissioner Sandy Brown. Here. Commissioner Alternate Dillis. Here. Commissioner Montesino. Here. Commissioner Hernandez. Present. Commission Alternate Schifrin. Here. Commission Alternate Quinn. Here. Commission Alternate McKeithen. Here. Commissioner McPherson. Here. Commissioner Kristen Brown. Here. Commissioner Pegler. Here. And Commissioner Rotkin. Commissioner Rotkin is absent today. All right, thank you. Uh, we'll move on. Do we have any AB 2449 just cause requests today? Seeing none. Any additions or deletions to consent or regular agendas? Yes, commissioners. Uh, yesterday we posted a staff report for item 31 and we posted handouts for items 4, 28, and 29. Great, thank you. We'll move now to number four, review of items to be discussed in closed session. Uh, good morning, commissioners. There are four items for the closed session this morning. Um, the first one is uh, labor negotiations for CORE and RAM. Second one is a brief update on the public employment, employment recruitment, recruitment for the, for the executive, executive director, director position. position. Uh, the, third uh, the third one, one relates, relates to, the to the general counsel and the uh, performance evaluation of public employment. And the last one relates to the anticipated litigation matter. And we do anticipate uh, bringing all four before the commission today. All right, great. Uh, do we have any public comment on our closed session items? Any online? Seeing none. Okay, we will recess to our closed session and return shortly. Thank you. And we'll start with a report out from closed session discussions. All right, thank you. We're gonna go now to item 10, which is oral communications. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the commission on any item within the jurisdiction of the commission that is not on today's agenda. Uh, the commission will listen to all communication and in compliance with state law, we will not take any action on items that are not on the agenda today. Uh, we ask that you state your name clearly so that it can be accurately recorded in the minutes and you will have two minutes uh, to, to uh, provide comment today. And we'll start with those uh, here in the room. Hi, welcome. Hi. My name is Christopher Perry. I live in the Blue and Gold Star Mobile Home Park on Lot 119. I have lived there for seven years and four months. I'm not the property owner. My brother, Jeff Perry, owns my home. He leases the space for it from the property owner management by the Blue and Gold Star Mobile Park LLC. I am 53 years old. I am developmentally disabled. I am a client of Imagine Supported Services and I live on Social Security income. I can work six hours per week and I work nearby at Pizza My Heart. Before my dad died, he helped my brother. Uh, before my dad died, he helped my brother buy this house so that I would have a nice safe place to live. I like it here. I have a nice neighbor. Neighbors I can bike to work or to shop. When we bought this home, the owner property, the, the property owner and manager never told us that it was encroaching into segment 10 of the rail corridor. We just found out about this a month ago. What has happened to the value of our home? We can't afford to sell it and buy another mobile home. Okay. Who will pay to move my home a few feet forward to get out of the corridor? 
how did this become our responsibility? This problem was created by the property owners. I think they should pay the bill. Moving my home or making me move is my, it's impossible. It would turn my life upside down. What would I do? Where would I go? And how would I pay for it? I need more time. I hope the RTP will vote for the interim trail for segment 10 so I can have more time to know what to do. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Any questions? No, thank you for your comments. Thanks. Hi, welcome. Good morning. Um, my name is Karen Anderson, and I have a mobile home in Castle Mobile Estates, uh, one that's been identified with an encroachment. My husband and I purchased our home in 1990, and uh, of course, there was no mention at that time of any encroachment. And over the years, our residents have had many meetings with the Capitola City Council in regards to the management of the park. And then with the subsequent purchase by Millennium, again, there was no issue on any party lines that were mentioned, property lines that were mentioned. Now with the pending decision of the ultimate trail, several of us on the train corridor find that our lives have been thrown in the chaos of the unknown, as well as facing significant financial loss. We've been given the ultimatum by the RTC to uh, move our home uh, off the encroachment or it's going to be done for us and we'll be sent the bail for doing so. I know there's been a huge learning curve among everyone as what it really means to move a double wide home. Uh, that's assuming there's a place to move it to, which there isn't. They're not travel trailers on wheels. Once they're in place, generally the next time it's moved, it's for demolition. I can't move my home and I can't sell it. New home, mobile home owners are now stuck between the RTC and the mobile park owners. Uh, we face significant loss of a place to live, as well as taking a huge, huge financial hit as we're not able to sell. I'm advocating for an interim trail to give us more time that we can come up with some type of plan to make this work. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, my name is Roxanne and I'm actually the neighbor of the woman, Karen, that just spoke. So pretty much what she said is definitely an encroachment on my mobile home as well. My concerns are the safety factors. I've seen these uh, fences along. I, I, the encroachment would bring my bedroom after I shaved two and a half feet off, will be right on the railroad tracks. And I'm concerned being right on 38th Avenue, where I have seen graffiti, I have seen homeless tents put up. I'd like to know if there's going to be any safety factors maintaining this uh, uh, railroad uh, that they're gonna keep on this um, side of where my mobile home is. And so what I'm concerned about is, you know, my property, I mean, my uh, mobile home uh, value has gone down. I can't sell it with an encroachment there. So I am asking if we can as well to put the inter interim trail along that uh, section. So I have more time to see what I'm gonna be doing with my mobile home. And like she said, they are not movable and uh, so and moving them two feet up is not going to solve the problem the house would be destroyed so thank you thank you hi welcome hi hello my name is christine mcgill i'm a retired senior citizen living on a fixed income as a widow on my husband's social security. I own my mobile home, which is affected by the RTC plans and Castle Mobile Estates. 
I've lived in Santa Cruz County for 37 years and then moved back October 22. When I bought my mobile home to be near my children and grandchildren, I was never advised by Castle Mobile Estates, property owner or management, the real estate agent, or the title company, or the seller that my mobile home was encroached on the RTC property. This matter has affected my mental and physical health. I can't afford the cost to move my home. I can't afford to lose my home and I can't sell it under these circumstances. This problem should have been identified and addressed by the railroad, Santa Cruz County and the RTC and the property owners years ago. You are now upending innocent people's lives. The other mobile home owners and I are not responsible parties. Low income housing is a priority in keeping people out of homelessness. A solution affecting low income housing should be your priority plan moving forward. And my big question is, where are we supposed to live when you split our house down the middle and move it? That's it. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. Uh, my name is Maria Rymuller, and I've lived in Santa Cruz my whole life. And I've lived in Castle Lomobo States for 24 years and the city of Capitola. I've served uh, in the nonprofit sector in Santa Cruz for many years, and my plans were to retire here uh, with the dream of affordable home ownership. Um, the previous owner of our park actually um, wanted to sell the park and wanted to evict us. And we went through that for many years. It was a protracted battle. Um, but when I bought my home in 2000, uh, I was never warned about this trail corridor. And I had gone to a lawyer, I checked it out, I thought everything was secure. So in the short term, removing the encroachments by June 2026 will be difficult for me to lose my backyard and my shed, but a much greater hardship will be longer term, just the unmitigated stress of it all, of being in limbo and um, you know, ongoing unpredictable changes in costs, which I may and my neighbors may be re required to pay for. And um, so I get it that this is a project that was voted on and the county and RTC is trying to do their job. But I also get it that even if I wanted out, I couldn't sell my home under these circumstances. I cannot make plans for the future because I'm now stuck, perhaps for years, before a resolution to these problems are sorted. I'm in support of the interim trail, that's a train down the middle, um, because it's the only, it's, it does the least harm to our community, including the uh, precious environment of trees and wildlife surrounding us. Thank you. Oh, hey. Um, <laughs> And the interim trail, I'm told, will give us some more time to work things out and adjust to these significant changes coming our way and basically to exhale. So thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning, Chair and members of the Commission. Jim Helmer from Ben Lomond. I'm here again to talk about pedestrian and traffic safety in the Ben Lomond Village. Um, Assembly Bill 43 was written and signed into law in 2021 in part to give Caltrans the authority to utilize prima facie speed limit setting in business districts on their state highways serving main streets of rural communities. The state's legislative council digest reads existing law before the bill establishes prima facie speed limit of 25 miles per hour on any highway other than a state highway. The bill now establishes a prima facie speed limit of 25 miles per hour on state highways as well, and gives Caltrans the authorization to reset speed limits lower to 25. Um, I've been in touch with Caltrans for years, even the last couple of months. The last month, Caltrans wrote to me they copied Bruce's office, they copied County Public Works, and they copied RTC staff. And I quote, I would need to hear from the County of Santa Cruz representatives in writing if they are requesting the speed limit be lowered to 25 miles per hour based upon the CVC section you're referring to 
and for what locations. Law enforcement would also need to support the language in writing. So in closing, Caltrans is looking at our county leaders to support us in Ben Loman. I'm requesting the RTC to agenda, agendize this matter for your May meeting and take into consideration making a written request to Caltrans to restore the speed limit in downtown Ben Lomond at 25 miles per hour. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is uh, Pedro Fregoso. I live at 255 to 8 Avenue Space 20 in the city of Capitola. We were living there since 2005. When we bought the mobile home, nobody told us there was encroaching on the, uh, the railroad track number 10. Uh, basically, we got nowhere else to go. I don't know if you guys are aware, if you split a mobile home up, you destroy it. Nothing else we can do. We have been working all my life trying to build something for my family. Something to retire off. We're almost a near age, our retirement age. Where are we going to go? What are we going to do? I mean, uh, we've been low by the citizens since the day we moved there. We've been no trouble for anybody. Uh, and now it's just turning on us. Why? We're not responsible. We weren't aware of what was going on with what the boat home. Nobody told us. Uh, we shouldn't be uh, liable for all this that's going on. I mean, uh, I think the mobile home owners should be the ones that are liable for everything that's going on. I mean, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome. Hi. Thank you. My name is Jean Brocklebank. I do not live in either Blue and Gold Star Mobile Home Park or which is in the unincorporated county or Cass Mobile Estates, which is in the city of Capitola. However, I am a, an appointee to the county's advisory mobile and manufactured home commission. And the residents of these parks are afraid, they're anxious, they're astonished, they're shocked, and they don't know what to do. And I have heard from all of them. So I support them 100% in asking first that this commission rethink about building say at least segment 10 and 11, and why not nine and 12, uh, so we don't have to cut out 1,711 trees in those segments, to reconsider doing the proposed projects, what's called the optional first phase interim trail, to give these folks the opportunity to have some extra time, which RC RTC staff assured us, that doing the optional first phase interim trail would give them a little bit more time to find out what's going to happen in their lives. Um, I know that the Board of Supervisors is going to hear this on March 26 to look at segment 10 and 11 EIR and certify it. And it's too bad that, uh, well, I'm glad to see two supervisors here and staff for the other three supervisors, but or, no, three supervisors, I'm sorry, Philippe. And, but uh, I know you're going to hear about this again on March 26. This is a wake up call right now. Build the interim trail down the center of the corridor and save trees and save human beings. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Good morning, thank you. My name is Michael Lewis. I live in Live Oak. I'm here to bring two items to your attention concerning the uh, segments 10 and 11 final EIR that was just released. I've spent the last two days examining the responses to my comments, and I found two flaws in the alternatives analysis that are alarming and uh, not too good uh, representation of what's going on in, in developing the FEIR. In the uh, description of alternatives, alternative one, the so-called trail only alternative, states that the rails will be permanently renewed, removed, and the trail built in this place. Well, this of course is not true because there's nothing permanent about building a trail. The trail can be removed at any time and rails replaced for future trail transport any time in the future, just as it is with the optional uh, interim trail option uh, that calls for exactly that same thing. 
uh, as a result, the uh, response to it removed the word permanently from that description, which was good because that makes it more truthful. But also they it added uh, the sentence, for purposes of analysis, it's assumed that the rail removal is permanent to provide a meaningful distinction between the optimal interim trail whereby removal is temporary. So this shows that the alternative one was very cleverly wordsmithed to make it appear that this did not, that that is precluded any use of uh, rail in the future. And this is not true. Secondly, the sentence rail banking is not required to implement alternative one is false. It was added to that uh, sentence. Alternative one re involves the removal of the rail and therefore rail banking will be necessary. So it's time to, to put on the emergency brake, bring this train to a halt, do some repairs before we get to the next station uh, to make this a uh, an EIR that is not subject to future legal, legal challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments in the room? Seeing none, we'll go online and we will start uh, with Johanna Lighthill. Hello, commissioners. My comments also relate to the uh, segment 10 and 11 EIR. It's over 2,300 pages and 800 of which is uh, inclusive of responses for, uh, to comments. People have a lot to say on this and I hope you'll consider. I just wanna to touch on one thing that might give us a glimpse of what challenges might lie ahead with planning both rail and trail in the corridor. None of the EIRs for the trail so far have addressed rail operation and how it might affect safety on the trail, but new trail designs bring the attention of the P California Public Utilities Commission since they have jurisdiction over the safety of rail crossings. In comments submitted, I read that the CPUC mandates immediately closing and removing the stairway at Prospect Avenue in Capitola. This is the stairway that connects people from the jewel box area to the village. It seems that this has been an informal crossing and CPUC wasn't aware of it. The EIR says that the county is planning to apply for a formal crossing here, but the CPUC explains that permitting any new crossing requires the closure of an existing crossing. And I didn't see any reference to what crossing might be selected for closure. I've heard of, um, I, I hope you can clarify. Commissioners, there's another informal crossing in Capitola um, at Coronado and Park Avenue um, from it connects people from Cliffwood Heights to New Brighton. And uh, I don't I didn't see any mention of that either. So closures or crossings, this is going to affect a lot of people and how they move within their communities. So I asked the RTC to address this further and to better inform the community of this new immediate challenge and what other challenges might lie ahead. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. We'll go next to Rebecca Downing. Uh, good morning, commissioners. My name is Rebecca Downing and for this comment, I'm speaking on behalf of the Seacliff Improvement Association that has represented residents and businesses in Seacliff since 1948. For those of you that were on the commission in 2019, you may remember the Seacliff Improvement Association hosted a pedestrian stroll to the newly installed Aptos Village Green to raise awareness about pedestrian safety. For those who wish to walk or cycle to Aptos Village from the surrounding neighborhoods, we invited all of the commissioners to join us and we thank Commissioner Rotkin for his participation on that day. Not a lot has changed for pedestrians traveling on foot or bike to Aptos Village. So we are hosting another stroll on August 3rd, exactly five years since the previous one. This time we applied for and received a grant from America Walks, a national nonprofit that advances safe, equitable, accessible, and enjoyable places to walk by giving people and communities the resources to effectively advocate for change. More than 200 organizations applied for one of the 10 grants sponsored by the Center for Disease Control. So we are honored to receive it and look forward to using it to bring the Aptos community together in the village this August. We invite commissioners and staff to mark your calendars for August 3rd. 
We will provide more details about this rule at future RTC meetings and look forward to having you join us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Michael Saint. Uh, yes, uh, good morning, Chair Brown. Thank you, and also Commissioners uh, Michael Saint with CFST and an Aptos resident. Uh, before I start my comments, I'd like to thank Supervisor Felipe Hernandez for attending a Romero Institute's uh, electric vehicle ride and drive event, which was last Sunday at Sacred Heart Church in Salinas. Supervisor Hernandez was a great addition to our event. Thank you very much. I'd like to comment on uh, EIR segment 12 um, and give you a list of what CFST has come up with as some of its issues. The EIR fails, uh, the EIR fails to substantiate claims of safety benefits of the ox lanes. EIR does not study bus on shoulder only. Project does not meet the project's objectives of safety to reduce congestion or greenhouse gas emissions reduction, uh, reduction or vehicle mile travel reductions. Climate change analysis is flawed. Uh, reduction in VMT countywide is invalid. Project conflicts with state climate legislation. Insufficient analysis of impacts of fish habitat in affected creeks loss of over 1,000 trees. This EIR is very deficient and has high and significant environmental impacts. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, we're going now to Terry Wood. Okay. Um, I'm Terry Wood. I live, at Ly I live at Blue and Gold Star Mobile Home Park along segment 10 of the rail corridor. This is regarding the encroachments. The environmental impact report didn't account for a three foot setback for homes along the corridor in Castle Estates or the Blue and Gold Star uh, parks. With this consideration, 82% of these homes will need to be relocated. To note, there may be some leniency for a couple homes, but not the majority. Emergency access is still a necessity. Uh, park owners, HCD, RTC, nor the railroads took any action to ensure proper, proper boundary lines for the whole of their ownership. I recognize the park owners are first and foremost responsible for such encroachments. Now that there, are, that, now that there is some funding available with a deadline, does the RTC take action to give these residents legal notice to clear these known encroachments when they've, when they've had more than a decade to investigate and address the, this issue. By all calculations, the ultimate rail trail is economically unsustaining and is destined to become a burden to the taxpayers in the future. I petition and urge the council to, ensure, to install the optional interim trail until all facets of the project are known, worked out, fully funded, and accountable also including the running and maintenance of the of the rail is incontestably self-sustaining. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further hands up online, we will close oral communications. Thank you everyone for your comments today. We'll move on to our consent agenda. Uh, all items appearing on the consent agenda are considered uh, in one motion if no member of the RTC wishes an item to be removed. All right, do we have any um, public comment on our consent agenda? Seeing none in person, seeing none online, we will- consent agenda. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, we don't have anyone joining us online from the commission today, so we'll do a voice vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. Moving down to our regular agenda, uh, item 25, commissioner reports. Do we have any commissioner reports at this end? Seeing none. Any commissioner reports at this end? Yes, go ahead. Uh, we got to do the tour with Caltrans uh, of the, the pedestrian bike bridge this other last week and uh, look at the uh, auxiliary lanes as well. And it looks like they're moving forward with the work despite the amount of rain that we've had, they're still pretty much on schedule and it's looking good. Um, 
they mentioned the EVs for all event in Salinas, um, trying to get folks in communities like Watsonville, Salinas to purchase EVs. And it was a good day out there talking to families and people uh, about EVs. And so just wanted to report that back. Thank you. Any further commissioner reports? All right, I will just share uh, briefly uh, in the city of Capitola, we are working on a quick build traffic calming project at uh, Bay Avenue. So uh, be prepared in the spring. Uh, you're going to see a reduction of some lanes, some changes in the options at the intersection at uh, Knob Hill it is for uh, safety reasons to ensure that traffic is moving slower and pedestrians have more opportunity to safely cross. So do be aware of that. It's coming uh, this spring. <clears throat> Okay, with that, we will move on to our director's report. Good morning, commissioners. Um, work recently got underway on Highway 1 Auxiliary Lanes and Bus on Shoulder Project between Bay Avenue Porter Street and State Park Drive. This project will also construct a bicycle and pedestrian overcrossing at Marvista Drive and replace the existing Capitola Avenue crossing. In order to construct the new overcrossing, a long-term closure of Capitola Avenue, Capitola Avenue is needed. On Monday, March 11th at 9 a.m., crews will close Capitola, the Capitola Avenue overcrossing to prepare for the demolition of the bridge. The closure will be, the closure will be in effect for about 14 months. Additionally, a 24-hour full closure of Highway 1 is needed for the demolition of the current overcrossing. This full closure will take place from Saturday, March 23rd at 7 p.m. through Sunday, March 24th at 7 p.m. Between, between the Bay Avenue, Porter Street, and Park Avenue interchanges. Demolition crews will use this 24-hour closure to safely demolish the overcrossing and haul of materials away. Sarah Christensen, our senior transportation engineer, will provide more information on this project later on our agenda. As uh, Commissioner Hernandez mentioned, uh, we, along with Commissioner Koenig, Montesino, and staff, had the opportunity to tour the Highway 1 Auxiliary Lane Bus on Shoulder project between 41st Avenue and Soquel. Uh, the project also includes the Chanticleer Bicycle and Pedestrian Overcrossing. We got an up-close look at the overcrossing, uh, which is going to improve regional connectivity for bicycles and pedestrians. And this project, along with our other phases of the Highway 1 projects, uh, will help transform how people travel throughout our community. If uh, other commissioners are interested in a tour like this of this project or other projects, uh, please let me know and we'll set something up. Uh, lastly, later this month, Commissioner Hernandez and I will be attending the Civic Well Policymakers Conference, which will include sessions on sustainable funding strategies for infrastructure and lessons on cross-jurisdictional governance from transportation. Commissioners, that concludes my report. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Reese. Um, the overcrossing, the pedestrian overcrossing, the Chanticleer uh, will be done, I, I presumably, before the highway uh, between uh, Soquel and, Ca and uh, 41st. Is there? Is it likely that people will be able to use that prior to that the highway portion of that being done? That's a fantastic question, Sarah. Thank you, Director Weiss. Um, we have been looking into that. We're evaluating whether that's a possibility, but um, it's not looking like that's going to be likely because um, although the structure work will be complete, there's quite a bit more railing, lighting, um, and other aesthetic feature installations that need to be done. And typically at the end of a construction project, there is a closeout period where um, the the project is accepted by you know the owner so the owner of the bridge is county so county would have to accept the bridge um and i just don't think that the um construction activities are going to work out in a way that we can open it early unfortunately um but it's just around the corner next year so <laughs> All right, uh, any further questions from commissioners? All right, thank you. Do we have any public comment on the director's report? Seeing none in the room and no hands raised online. Uh, we'll go now to our Caltrans report. Commissioner Eid, you're still on mute. Oops, 
I guess I right. did the wrong way there, sorry. Uh, good morning, Chair Brown and members of the commission. Scott Eads, District 5 District Director. I uh, have a few items for you. One is uh, good news from our perspective on winter storm damage. We did receive um, significant storm events and some level of damage in other parts of the district, um, notably Santa Barbara, San Luis Obispo, and Monterey counties. But uh, so far, um, knock on wood and fingers crossed, um, we're in good shape in Santa Cruz and we'll do everything we can to keep the roads open with any future storms. Uh, I wanted to report out on a report that was just released by CalSTA, that's the California Secretary of Transportation Agency. Um, they re released a report on CAPDI, which is the Climate Action Plan for Transportation Infrastructure. Um, CAPDI was adopted in July 2021, and so they just re released a report um, noting and reporting out on the progress that's been made and there has been great progress um, so far um, for many different transportation related actions that are associated with climate change. Um, CAPTI lists 34 key action items and of those 25 are already complete and the remaining are on track to be completed by July of this year. So great news, the report's online. Um, there's a lot of key actions there that we, that, uh, we have been working for some time. And then also want to announce that Safe Streets for All funding opportunity is coming up. This is a U.S. DOT um, grant program. Uh, it's uh, there's 1.1 uh, million, just over 1.1 million dollar, or sorry, billion dollars in funding available nationwide. Cities, towns, counties, tribal governments, MPOs are all eligible to apply. And then there's two different programs within Safe Streets for All. One of them is the implementation grants. Those are due, um, applications are due on May 16th. And then there is planning and demonstration grant applications, which can, it's another portion of the grant program um, with different deadlines. There's, the first would be April 4th. There's another one on May 16th and another one on August 29th. So just an FYI, a lot of information online related to that grant program. And then the last thing I wanted to note is that there was some discussion uh, at the December board meeting about the FLAP funded. This is a federal um, funding category um, for a segment of the North Coast tra Rail Trail. Um, that project, which there was some um, level of discussion around the Caltrans comments, the project's now moving forward. FHWA has advertised it for construction and they have a bid opening scheduled for the end of March. So uh, thanks for working through those final comments with us. We appreciate your patience on that. That concludes my report. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. Questions from commissioners? Seeing none, do we have any public comment on this item? Also seeing none, thank you so much. We appreciate the report. We'll move now to item 28, Glideways presentation. And I will turn it over, Luis, are you getting us started or? Well, just a uh, quick, quick introduction. And the, the commission did ask um, that uh, we request Glideways to make a presentation on their uh, uh, on their solution for for transportation that they're working on in, in partnership with the city of San Jose and also Contra Costa and I think uh, in some other locations. So uh, representatives from Glideways are here to make that presentation uh, for you and to ask any questions that you would like. Great, thank you. Welcome. Great, thank you, Luis. Thank you, Kristen. Um, I've met some of the board members before, but um, for anybody I haven't met, my name is Dustin Earl. I'm VP of Business Development at Glideways. Prior to Glideways, I was at Lyft for about seven years and started a number of different teams there. Um, I'm an attorney. Uh, before way, going way back, I actually went to UCSC and lived in Santa Cruz for a number of years. Um, so I'm very familiar with the area and excited to talk with you guys today. Paul? Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Paul Jampkard. I'm an architect, mm -hmm. urban designer. Um, don't have the same experience that Dustin has had in Santa Cruz. Years ago, I worked on some of the early concepts for the redevelopment of Pacific Station. It's very nice to see that underway and transforming that part of downtown. Um, and also, even in a life before that, worked on some of the concepts for the master planning at UC Santa Cruz. Um, my experience, uh, my role at the company is the director of system design and infrastructure planning. And the experience I bring to that in this new kind of technology is a lot of years of experience up in the Portland area. I'm developing alignments for the MAX light rail system. So I bring a lot of that sort of real world transit experience to this new technology. We're very excited to share with you today. So thank you very much. 
Great. And we've got a, a brief presentation. I'm going to give a high level Glideways overview. Uh, we're going to talk about some of our project wins, one just over the hill in, in San Jose, another one in the East Bay, and then a third um, in San Bernardino County. And then Paul is going to bring it hyper local back to Santa Cruz. Um, and we're going to talk about how um, if you put in the, the commuter rail, how we can be a last mile solution to local points of interest like Dominican Hospital, Cabrillo College, UCSC, Watsonville Airport. Um, and potentially if the commuter rail doesn't go in, in place at certain times, um, we may be able to service that area going from Watsonville to Santa Cruz um, while still keeping keeping the rail for freight, keeping the trail for people and um, make, meeting capacity concerns as well as um, as as well as providing a phenomenal user experience. So, I don't know that the clicker is going. Worked before. It was working before. <laughs> Let's see. All right. We'll we'll just do the the old fashioned one. Next next slide. Thanks. <laughs> Um, so I always like to start off with what Glideways is from a high level because it's really simple. It's origin to destination without any stops on a dedicated fixed guideway. So the vehicles never interact with pedestrians. They never interact with other cars. This is not an open road solution. It's not like Waymo. It's not like Cruise. It's on a dedicated guideway. Uh, next slide. So when we were first coming up with Glideways back in 2016, we wanted to start with the rider experience. So the, you know, we want to provide a, a tr extraordinary rider experience. And so we talked to people, we said, hey, what would it take for you to actually get out of your car and take transit? If you take transit, what would make that experience better for you? And hands down, 100% of people said predictable fast transit times. They didn't want a trip to take 10 minutes one day, 20 minutes another day, 30 minutes another day, because they got a train got stuck in a tunnel, uh, they missed the bus, their car got stuck in traffic, whatever the reason. And so that's what we provide. We provide direct origin to destination without any stops in between on a dedicated fixed skyway. So you have predictable transit times. Our vehicles travel at 30 miles per hour. So that's two minutes a mile. So if you're going five miles, the trip's going to take 10 minutes every single time, not nine minutes, not 11 minutes, 10 minutes every single time. The next thing that people wanted was it to be comfortable and spacious. So our vehicles are one to six passengers. If you have a larger group, you can platoon multiple vehicles. The rides can be shared or they could be personal rides. Even if they're shared rides, it's still origin to destination without any stops. We batch people together that are going to the same destination. And then there's tons of space for, for luggage, sporting equipment, bicycles. I'm a surfer myself. You could get probably eight foot long board, maybe even nine foot long board in there. It's really, um, really spacious. And then from an ADA standpoint, not only do we meet ADA standards, we actually exceed ADA standards. So a person in a wheelchair can come in, they can fully turn around, they can ride with two companions. Um, we've done tons of user testing at our site. Um, we've given about 800 rides at our site in Concord, California. It's a little over an hour away. We invite the board to come ride our system, experience it. Experience it is, is believing. I mean, you'll, you can ride in it. This isn't vaporware. Um, they're awesome. And, um, and, and so the user experience for people in wheelchairs has been phenomenal. People have said, we really enjoy the system. We can get on and off the vehicles at our leisure um, without having to worry about holding up a whole bus or a train full of people. Um, based on this user testing, we actually redesigned our vehicle in 2024. So just two months ago, uh, we released this. This is, we've got former Apple and Google and Tesla engineers and de designers that have uh, built this. Um, you'll see the, the tires there. There's a, um, there's a cover on them. That's just to prevent uh, water wicking on the, on the LiDAR. But what's under there is just rubber tires. Same as you'd have on a car. There's no induction charging or anything. It's just rubber tires on pathway. The vehicles, they're quiet. They're battery electric, zero emissions vehicles. Um, and then the inside of the vehicle, we designed this to really be an oasis. We want people to get in, um, sit back, relax, feel like they've already arrived at their destination. Once they're, once they're in the vehicle, you can use Wi-Fi. You can play your own music, adjust the, type, the, the lighting, the temperature. Um, it's really, I mean, I've ridden it myself. It, it's an awesome experience. Um, you can ride with your bike. 
is a spot for a bike slot. Uh, next slide. And then looking at the system, and Paul's going to go into more detail on this. We wanted these to be low impact systems that quietly go through the community. So the systems can be, the guideways can be at grade, they can be elevated, or they can be underground, or a combination of all three, which is what we're doing in Santa, San Jose. Next slide. And so what we've really done here is we've right-sized to demand. It's really simple. Smaller vehicles equal smaller infrastructure. So with a five and a half foot guideway, we can go single direction. With a 15 foot guideway, we can go two directions. Um, and putting cars on a guideway, that's nothing special. Anybody can do that. Where our intellectual property comes in and how we can, from a capacity standpoint, service anywhere from a few hundred people per hour, all the way up to 10,000 passengers per hour per direction is our IP is for how the vehicles get on and off the guideway and how they can travel it up to sub-second headways without ever having to stop or ever having to slow down. And that's what makes us different than literally every other solution that's out there in the world. Um, and that's why you know we've applied for, for four RFPs so far. We've won two and we've been down selected at, at two others. Um, so we've got you know great track record there. And um the one one last point on this, I like to think of it like a highway. Um, it's really simple, just like a highway. Vehicles are going in two different directions, and occasionally they pull off to pick people up and drop people off. And that's that's how our system works. Um, next slide. So just touching on some of our project wins. Uh, San Jose and our San Francisco Bay Area Transit Connector, these are going to start build in 2026. Um, and they're going to be live revenue service in 2028, maybe early 2029. So for the San Jose Airport to Downtown Connector, this one's really um, an interesting project because this is one that they wanted to do for over 20 years, but it was going to cost $2 billion to put a, a train in. And so we came to them, we said, hey, look, we can do the 4.5 mile system. We can have nine stations. We can do it for a fraction of the cost um, to put the train in. And we can do it right now. It's, it's 550 million for the capital expenditure. Um, this is one of our more expensive projects because it's mostly elevated. There's going to be some underground. Um, but what's really cool about this project, it's a P3 delivery. So because our capital expenditures are so low and our operating expenditures are so low, we were able to attract private financing um, through plenary group. And so, um, and so plenary is funding the vast majority of the project. And so not only is it going to not cost $2 billion for the city to put it in, it's, they're going to, there's going to be a very fractional um, subsidy required on the city's part. The San Francisco Bay Area transit connector. This is one in East Contra Costa County. Uh, it's a 28 mile regional connector connecting four different cities to five heavy rail stations. One of the things that all of these um, these projects have in common is they're feeders into into other transit modes. So we want to drive ridership. We want to drive traffic to to other modes of transportation. Um, and then lastly, San Bernardino County Airport connector. This is a 4.2 mile system. It's uh, mostly underground, and it's, again, connecting to, to existing transit, to the Metrolink, and then also to the Brightline station that's going to Vegas. So I'm going to, Paul, kind of bring it, bring it local, and then we're open to questions. Very good. Thank you very much. <clears throat> yeah, it was, uh, we've really appreciated kind of like coming into the conversation today. And, you know, from the outside, we, we understood that there was a lot going on with this corridor, the entire conversation, um, had some sense of the sensitivities. Um, but it's really good to come down and kind of uh, engage the conversation directly to, to appreciate them more fully. Um, next slide, please. Um, one of the things that we want to leave you with today, uh, first of all, is to plant a seed uh, of the, that we exist, that we're real, that we're a maturing technology that will be ready for the marketplace as reliable as other modes we have out there in the marketplace today. The other key thing is how we differ. We differ in our size, we differ in our operational requirements, and we, di we differ significantly in the impact we have on the corridor and the environment that we operate in. So what, some of the key things that we've um, registered in the community that we hope to uh, address within this is uh, alleviating the congestion. Highway 1, we're all aware, is a real problem, but the surface streets as well uh, become problems for people just getting around the community. Um, 
in addition to that, the housing situation is a very real one. I live in San Francisco, he's in Southern California. We're all aware that the housing is super sensitive and you know, basically getting out of reach. Transportation plays a really key part of making that affordable and actually changing the way we plan and develop housing. So we really wanna be able to help support transit oriented development in this community. Uh, the regional climate um, kind of priorities of this community are part of its culture. We definitely want to be able to reinforce those and carry those forward in this new project. Um, and lastly, these two elements are really about this as a place. Um, we recognize the historical significance and the unique kind of lifestyle here in Santa Cruz and the California coast. Uh, we think we are a really good fit for that. And hopefully we can kind of um, convey some of that in what we're presenting today. Next, please. <clears throat> so. The big picture, of course, is this connection all the way from Davenport up the coast, all the way over to Watsonville, but also the much more intense use that you all live with every day here in Santa Cruz to Aptos. Um, and there are a number of different ways we could draw a line and make these connections happen. The centerpiece of this morning's conversation, of course, is the rail line, but the Highway 1 also presents a bit of a corridor that we could explore for application of this technology. This morning, we're not making any recommendations. We're just trying to kind of outline kind of like the requirements and the opportunities that we might be able to explore if we go forward together. So next slide. Um, this is intended to kind of provide more focus where the real key ridership is, as we understand it. And the catchment diagrams going along parallel to the alignments themselves really try to convey the nature of the catchment that not only a pedestrian walking experience could do, every transit planner will look at that, but also what the light mobility of cycling and micro mobility can afford. So to really get a sense of how much of this community could be served by a system like this. Another key point to kind of note with this in contrast, maybe to some of the planning of, of train options is the number of stops we can do. As Dustin described, the vehicles are much smaller, our infrastructure is much smaller, so the cost of all those capital expenses is significantly less than the bigger modes that are on the table today. But we'll also have a lot more opportunity to create access points, as we call them. We don't even call them stations. Station conveys something significant in its scale, but the access points are really just points where we've got a number of different berths where the vehicles can be accessed by people boarding and exiting the system. Next. And this is a sense of just how big those vehicles are. Uh, the cross section of, um, required for a single lane, as Dustin mentioned, is five and a half feet. That raised portion in between the two lanes of opposing direction is an egress platform that is accessible from the vehicles directly. So there's no dropping two feet to get from a train out to the, should something break down. We really try to um, weave that accessibility through the entire system. And so that cross section is a, a mere 14 or 16 feet if we go outside to the barriers necessary. As he mentioned, the vehicles are, require a protected space. So wherever our system goes, it's going to be protected by fencing to keep people out, to keep critters out, and just to basically preserve that operating space to keep it simple and high performance, delivering the kind of point-to-point um, -point nonstop experience with the capacities that we want to be able to deliver. But this is a, an illustration of how we could fit alongside the freight. This is not a configuration that would work necessarily in parallel or in tandem with the same space of a light rail. It would have much more regular, heavy, uh, larger vehicles and a more regular use. But this preserves that rail line for the intermittent use that the freight might require along the corridor. And of course, there would be coordination of timing and things like that. Um, our system is designed to be 24-7, but it can be whatever this community and the operating model decides to be. Uh, the vehicles themselves, because they're small, um, are on demand as well. So this wouldn't be a scheduled 15, 20, 30 minute kind of regular schedule. It would be on demand. And that's one of the key features that makes this sort of the desirable option to get people out of their cars, giving them the freedom and flexibility to go where they want, when they want. And so those two diagrams of cross section, they're really not proposals. They are just to give you a sense of all the space that we need to kind of fit into this very sensitive, highly coveted corridor. Um, and hope that you can start to imagine yourself where and how these might go. The last is really how we are hoping to respond to some of, the, some of those um, concerns identified. Number one, get people out of their cars, um, make more appealing the options that we have of bicycles, micromobility, walking, in addition to the transit systems that are already in place. We wanna be able to enhance the current options on the table so that we can perhaps provide even more housing. If we can alleviate the parking requirements for a given location, that's better places, more units, all the options I think are, are toward the goal of more housing for the community. Um, 
Again, echoing the priorities and culture of this community, we want by running electric, on-demand, small-scale, we reduce the carbon footprint of the entire system, and we make this much more aligned to the kind of the culture that Santa Cruz is about. Um, and then, the, again, the final two, they're going to be quiet. They're going to be on-demand. They could fit within for like the, the coastal communities that we've got, particularly the more sensitive ones further towards Aptos and to the, to the east, um, as well as the very tightly constrained ones we've got here right in town. And then finally, um, the legacy of this is a part of Santa Cruz's history and, and culture. Uh, we wanna be able to bring more people to it to experience it for the value it provides rather than just hoping one day it'll become something worth doing. And that, I think that's the bottom line that we wanna share with you today. So we're happy to take any questions and discussion you have. Thank you. Questions from commissioners? Yeah, go ahead. So for the last mile options, how does it work? Does it need like a guided pathway for it as well too? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So whatever mode you have along the corridor or even any of the large boulevards or things like that, we would need to create a new pathway. Of course, the, the rail corridor is a gift that you have today. But as you can see from the size, we would need to kind of create a relatively small, almost like a comparable bicycle path dedicated to our operations to make those extensions to Cabrillo College, et cetera. Um, very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, we have a lot of, uh, on the rail line, a lot of uh, cross paths. Mm -hmm. um, who would have the right of way, so to speak, for a stop sign there? Because there's a number of them between Santa Cruz, Watsonville, or whatever. We avoid that question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, and, and let me answer that's a little glib. Um, effectively, imagine a series of pedestrian scale bridges that will allow our vehicles to pass over those crossings, those grades. There may be some grade modification at those crossings. There may be kind of, we might ch change the number of them depending upon sort of like value and impact to the system and to the community around it. All of that is an ongoing process, but the measure itself, the infrastructure necessary to overcome those is really effectively a pedestrian bridge to allow us to leap over that. Or go under it, right? Or go under it. We could trench and pass underneath too. In your project that you are building out in for the San Jose um, downtown to the airport, are you using a right away of uh, the county city or are you going through Caltrans? Yeah, we're, except for less than 5%, maybe 3% is a taking of a, a single parcel, one little parcel. Otherwise, we're making our way through um, Caltrans space, city rights of way, or the public park. Um, one of the critical things about the project and it's our ability to go forward is the ability to go through that park. They looked at a number of other more you know, conventional modes, light rail, trolleys, et cetera. The park just said no. The sensitivities of the habitat, the open space, the population, the activities they want to have there were utterly incompatible with those modes. But we were able to kind of come to an understanding about how the scale and our integration with the landscape makes this more of a complement to their park than it is a negative impact to it. Thank you. Question. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. It's it's good to hear from you and and see you here. It's something. This is something that I've been learning about and hearing about. Um, I see Mr. Garrett is here in the room as well. His advocate uh, who's been teaching me. Um, I have a question about on the operation side. Just wondering. I can envision how that works with respect to infrastructure development and um, management, but um, overall how your operations fit within the public sector transit um, kind of world in the places where you're, oper where you're developing projects. Sure. Um, well, uh, first of all, um, just the fundamentals of the operations. The, we don't have schedules. They're all on demand. The vehicles are small scale. They're serviced in a single warehouse facility, ideally. Uh, we call it an MSF, maintenance servicing, um, charging facility effectively. That's relatively small compared to other kind of yards for larger scale, things like that. Um, and where we connect with uh, transit is really one of coordination and planning. So we can put these access points where there's already concentrations of uh, intermodal stations or other stops, key locations. And then it becomes just a matter of sitting down with the local transit. And we can adjust the size of the fleet to match both the schedule and the capacity goals for the system itself. And we can then, uh, with sort of the machine learning, the very sophisticated controls we develop to really um, synchronize with those surges that might come off of other transit 
Definitely the case of what's happening in San Jose, where we've got multiple trains coming into Deer Dawn. We've been able to engineer for that so that people don't have, you know, crush loading, you know, backups and things like that. So where it's an open, very flexible system. We, we, we see this as a, as a potential feeder for the, the new transit hub as well. Yeah. So what's uh, um, what's the cost factor? Like, like not the project wise, but like the the uh, someone I'm gonna go use it. Uh -huh. uh, how much does it cost? So it, it's gonna be um, comparable to public transit fares. Um, that's that's what we're that's what we're working towards in San Jose. Um, the rides can be shared or they can be personal. Um, and so the. For the for the personal rides, we're, we're pricing those at about two times the, the fare of what a public ride would cost. But if you you know if you got a party of four or five, and that's that's pretty cost effective. Thank you. Questions on this end? Yes, go ahead. Hello. Yes, I just wanted to ask um, if you could expand on the P three delivery, um, and you know if there is any benefits um, as to the contributions from local municipalities um, when a project is P3 delivered uh, compared to those that are not. Okay, yeah, no, it, there's a lot to P3 public-private partnerships. Um, Dustin had mentioned Plenary Group, Plenary North America. They're a leading DBFOM, design, build, finance, maintain, and operate um, developer. Uh, they deliver uh, turnkey infrastructure projects um, all around the United States, North America. Um, and so part of the reason we've engaged them is because they could see in us a capital cost model that they could privately finance. As you could well imagine, when you can bring private capital to a project, because they see that there's profit to be made from that project, things can happen much more quickly on the financing and execution side. There's still, of course, a public process to kind of you know, plan and coordinate that with all the other agencies and interests in the uh, community, but it really does accelerate and simplify the financing side of things to the point where in some situations, if capital costs and ridership balance, we can have a zero subsidy system, both in a cap cost and in ongoing operating costs. And you have a concession for the, for the developer that makes them whole as well. So it really does change the game of how typical transit is being designed and en engineered, financed and executed. Yeah, go ahead. Um, how do you keep the system running in terms of, you know, when some vehicles need to slow down, others speed up, and how do you coordinate all that? Do you have a a, a central place somewhere that's that's monitoring all that? Yeah, there's a there's an operation control center um, that's monitoring everything and then and and it's all programmed in um, into the system, but Paul. Yeah, well, the, it is a, it's a system that operates intelligently at two levels. Uh, at the level, as Dustin referred, sort of the overall comprehensive fleet management system, kind of like maintaining balance throughout the entire fleet. But then the individual vehicles, they operate with multi-redundant sensors and navigation for autonomous management and navigation through the system. And so effectively, they're all moving with awareness of each other. Um, and then the last sort of envelope that really assures uh, ongoing reliable performance is we sense the entire corridor. So if there's an intrusion that could have impact on our vehicle's movements, we know ahead of time. We can anticipate that, we can mitigate against it, um, and therefore we add you know, triple, quadruple levels of redundancy to make sure, as he said, you can get a 10-minute ride every time. And, and unlike open road, where open road solutions like Waymo, they have to Imagine they have to look at everything around them, whereas we just have to know the, the guideway and know, you know, something's coming over the fence. Oh, it's over the fence. OK, cool. We're going to go around it. Um, yeah, we simplify the problem. Yeah. So that's are you done? Yeah. that's a nice segue to my question. I think I wanted to follow up on one ask down mm -hmm. here. Um, when your guideway, when your vehicles in guideways are approaching any kind of crossing, and I'm thinking of pedestrian crosswalks, any pedestrian simply stepping into the street. Um, what's the system for avoiding a collision? Well, earlier Dustin referred to us like a highway. We're really more like a freeway. And the freeway, as we all understand, doesn't have at grade crossings with pedestrians. Nobody bicycles on a freeway. We really need to dedicate that small space to our operations. So there won't be any at grade pedestrians crossings. They'll either go under it or over it, will go over it or go under it. So we just really avoid those at grade conflicts. So imagining accessing Cabrillo College, mm -hmm. Dominican Hospital, mm -hmm. those would be below grade or above grade rather than at grade? 
It could be any of the above. And, that, and that's, we have the flexibility to assess any given location. The vehicles are small. They can overcome significant grade changes so we can make those transitions. And it's gonna be a site, uh, case by case sort of process. You'll know we've been working on PRT issues for, uh, by my notes, since my oldest are from 20, 2000. Okay. And uh, issues of above grade, uh -huh. you know, raised uh, guideways become kind of a, an issue for visibility, impacts on neighborhoods and so forth. Yeah, no, we're very aware that this is going to be a new thing, a new big thing running through your community. The goal, of course, is to you know diminish the need for the other big spaces we allocate to automobiles, for one. And two, with the lower cap costs, we can turn those things into more than just an elevated causeway. We've talked about creating covered walkways for the public. We can create spaces underneath that for any number of different activities when we are in the air. And so it's we're not just stuck by the constraints of extreme kind of budget uh, control to, to only do one thing. We can actually provide this high value uh, service with transportation and have a little bit of resources left to do the important things to make it a nice thing within the community. Like paths, walking pedestrian paths. Exactly. Yes, go ahead. Two additional questions. Um, as it pertains to like metrics, um, is there a number of passengers per day that you were looking for? Um, you know, for a successful uh, project um, that you guys um, would be proposing, um, as well as wondering if there, um, if you guys would have any interest or consider leasing space from the RTC or a local government to privately operate the transportation system, and then. Um, Lastly, if we were interested in the technology, um, what would be the next steps? You want to answer yeah, any so, one of those? <laughs> yeah. So, um, as far as as far as number of, of passengers per day, uh, I believe you guys are expecting around six thousand. I, I believe on the on the rail. We um, did a study with Steer for the San Jose project. They estimate that because of how how cool the vehicles are and how easy they are to 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 use, that there'll be about a twenty nine to forty six percent increase in ridership so um the numbers that you guys are expecting um we would absolutely do um and then what was the second question sorry oh leasing the space yes totally we're open to i mean we're small enough and flexible enough we can work with the available real estate real available corridors uh because you know like i said uh where that msf facility goes we can kind of like be strategic about that um, the fleet size uh, and the ridership goals, again, that's going to come out of more steps and study. Um, and so to your last question, the questions you just posed would be a great part of a, an initial agenda to a follow-up, uh, effectively a study session to sit down and listen to your thoughts about what you've heard today, about some of the other goals and challenges that this corridor development and the regional transportation uh, sort of ambitions uh, contain. And then we will see where and how we can fit and take something forward. Uh, to kind of give it a little bit more structure. But um, again, as I mentioned at the very beginning, what we're trying to do today is find a seed of potential, uh, compatibility, and value. Yeah, and we, we'd love, I mean, just as a, as a follow-up, we'd love to have the board come, come to our site. It's probably a little over an hour, hour and a half away. Um, actually ride the vehicles. We have mayors and city council and, and people out there almost every single week uh, trying, you know, riding the system and experiencing it because... We, we just want you guys to see it and, and see where it could plug in. Yeah, um, that's actually a really good next step. Yeah, to, riding it for real is amazing just to watch people who experience coming in, skeptics coming out converted. So, appreciate it. Additional questions? No? Okay, I just have a quick question. Um, thank you for the presentation and thank you for being here today. I, I appreciated the opportunity to meet with you virtually previously and, and get a presentation from you. And I can certainly um, see the benefits of this as a feeder into transit modes um, or perhaps on the freeway or uh, Soquel. Um, when we met, I had asked you if you are looking to be an alternative to passenger rail and you said that that wasn't the case. And your slides today, it looks like that um, you should, you mentioned freight rail, but it looks like there wouldn't be an alternative, an opportunity for passenger rail if you're looking to be in the branch line. So can you just clarify for me if you're, if you are interested in being a feeder into transit modes or an alternative to some of the transit modes that we are already looking at? From a high level company strategic, we just want to get our place in the minds of people like you who are making these choices. Mm -hmm. We could certainly do the job of providing all the transit all the way through the corridor and the branches as well. But we don't want to you know, undo or presume to kind of ignore all the good work that's gone into developing this concept. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Any other questions? No? Okay, great. Thank you for your presentation, gentlemen. Do we have any public comment on this item in the room? Hi, welcome. Hi. Yeah, I'm Brett Garrett, and I want to thank you for scheduling this presentation from Glideways. Um, I personally see it as a very good prospect as the primary uh, transit link between Watsonville and Santa Cruz. Um, I think it's a very good example of personal rapid transit, which could provide better transportation than the conventional rail proposals that I've seen. Um, I've heard people at other meetings have said, well, you know, we had the transit corridor alternatives analysis and, you know, people say we've already studied this and rejected it. And I kind of want to debunk the idea that the transit corridor alternatives um, um, was, um, I'm trying to figure out how to say how to say this, that it did a good job of analyzing it before rejecting it. Um, it did give scores based on various criteria, and it gave very low scores for PRT. But most of those low scores really did not make sense. Um, in some cases, they were not explained, and in other cases, the um, criteria were written in such a way that PRT just got a low score because of the way it was written. For example, active transportation. The alternatives analysis said this is not friendly to bicycles because the vehicles are very small. Um, but there's so many of these vehicles, so so the PRT could you could many bicycle many bicyclists could use the system in an hour, um, almost unlimited compared to a train where it's just the number of bikes that fit in the train maybe twice an hour or something like that. Um, also, with regard to feasibility, feasibility has increased so much since the alternatives analysis and many other examples. So I just want to say that I disagree with the conclusions of the alternatives analysis uh, milestone two. And please do give serious consideration to personal rapid transit, including glideways and other innovative transportation systems. Thank you very much. Hi, welcome. Hi, right, good morning. Thank you so much for all of you for your efforts on the rail trail. It must be really great to actually see part of it functioning. And I'm hoping I live long enough to see a nice green hydrogen powered uh, tram going up and down it. And that brings me to the subject of PRT. Um, it's, it's a great idea for the future for our population growth to have the, the rail line uh, accessible for uh, public transportation. There's a little bit of a problem though, because there's a gap um, a few years ago, the number was 8,000 trips a day on Highway 1 to the university from Mid-County and beyond. So the, the tram is great, but it doesn't get you to the university. It doesn't get those 8,000 plus cars to the university um, or the people without the cars, hopefully. So that's where PRT comes in. We have the levee, as you know, going from right down by where the uh, tram stop on by the boardwalk would be going up towards Costco and behind there is uh, empty land and it, it's scheduled someday, hopefully not to go into a four lane paved highway or paved road. Uh, that's completely unnecessary. The river one junction is extremely impacted already. As you know, PRT would be the perfect link to go from the rail trail up to the university's transit system on the west side of the campus. So obviously uh, you're not gonna be able to approve that today, but I urge you to do it as soon as possible, or at least keep it in the back of your mind for when the day arrives. We do need a link from the rail trail to one of the major uh, locations people are commuting to, and it could also loop through the downtown transit center. It's only half a block. So that would be a perfect piece to finish your puzzle and continue working on it, I hope. Thank you very much. Thank you. Additional public comment. Hi, welcome. Thank, sorry. Thank you. My name is Portia, and as someone that uses um, mobility, uh, an electric wheelchair to get around, and, and uh, almost exclusively public transportation, I'm always for anything that can load at level. It's just so much easier and uh, efficient because it, you know, it. The buses are great and the bus drivers are awesome and they bring down the ramps and so forth. It just takes a lot of time and slows the whole process down. 
Um, in addition to that, um, I did find this option kind of interesting about how it's mostly in the, it's still guided. So you, if you did choose to do it next to a trail or something, I would still feel significantly safer there than on the sidewalks of say Mission Street or wherever. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Matt Farrell. I'm uh, speaking today for Friends the Rail and Trail. Um, we uh, have uh, seen quite a lot of discussion about personal rapid transit solutions in our community. And as Commissioner Pegler mentioned, uh, they haven't really proved to be uh, very feasible with the options that were available in those at those times. I think that uh, we don't claim to be experts in this technology or approach, but we have these observations. First, we really believe it's important that any consideration of this alternative not only include the RTC, but also our transit district. Unfortunately, in San Jose, as we understand it, there's a difference of opinion between the transit agency and um, the city of San Jose about solutions to the airport connection. And uh, I would hope that we don't see that in our community because we've really gotten to a place now where the transit district and the RTC leadership are working together. And I think we need to maintain that unity. Secondly, I would say, I think we feel more comfortable exploring this option as a last mile solution. The real challenges now in terms of building a rail connection in our community are to destinations like Rio College and UCSC. And uh, the presenters today have made that presentation. So um, I won't say any more about that, but thank you for my time. Thank you. Any additional comments in the room? Seeing none, we will go online and we'll start with Michael Saint. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Brown, and uh, thank you, uh, Glideways, for your presentation. Um, I know some people will be skeptical about new technology, uh, but if we can all keep an open mind uh, that there are other transportation modes that may be more practical and maybe better uh, than the older technologies of buses and trains. Um, I had a few of the highlights I liked about the presentation and think are very good for transportation in general. Uh, the idea of the fare box actually helping cover the costs of operation and maintaining these vehicles is uh, highly important. Also, the PRT proposals also significantly reduce reliance on public funding, which seems to be a big uh, problem for most things like trains and buses. And in general, and in my opinion, our goal in this county should be to select a transportation system that alleviates increasing congestion on our highways and arterial roads. Glideways has actually suggested this or said they would do this in the Contra Costa County project. So far, Santa Cruz County is only offering an alternative train solution and basically not much congestion relief. I think we can do much better. I think relieving congestion should be one of the number one goals in our transportation projects. I'd also like to thank Commissioner Koenig and Commissioner Rotkin for bringing Glideways here today. And I'm always very thankful to Brett Garrett for pushing this technology on us and hope we keep going and have an open mind about it and uh, come to some type of conclusion. I know you're pretty far off with getting something on the rail trail, so we have time and there'll probably be some more improvement technology wise. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Go next to Brian Peoples. You should be able to unmute yourself now. All right, we'll come back to you. Uh, ben Vernaza. Good 
Okay. I just have a question to throw out for everybody to think about. And that is, uh, what do we do with the 57 new buses that we're buying? Question mark. Think about it. Include it in any analysis. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we will return to Mr. Peoples. Having some technical difficulties, perhaps. Yeah. Is it not allowing us to unmute him or is it? Okay. All right, let's um, let's do this. Let's move on to our next item. And Mr. Peoples, once we figure out the technical difficulties, we will allow you to provide comment on this item at the next item. All right, uh, bringing it back, we're gonna move on to item 29. It's informational update regarding the community's preference between two single span bridge types for the coastal rail trail segment 12 bicycle and pedestrian bridge over Aptos Creek and Soquel Drive. Hi, welcome. Hi, thank you, Chair Brown. Um, in January, the RTC staff released a video and a short survey in order to solicit input on the community's preferred bridge type for the Coastal Rail Trail Segment 12, Bicycle and Pedestrian Bridge in Aptos. The two options were the Tide Arch Bridge and the Stress Ribbon Bridge, both with similar costs and maintenance. The survey had 889 respondents and um, 59.95% of the votes were from Aptos residents and the rest were throughout the Santa Cruz County. Um, Tide Arch Bridge had the most votes with 57.89% and the Stress Ribbon Bridge with 42.11% votes. The project development team recommends moving forward with the Tide Arch Bridge in agreement with the survey results. We received two public comments asking to reconsider design choice for various reasons. The staff has considered and recommends not changing course at this time due to overall public votes and the votes specifically in Aptos being in favor of the Tide Arch Bridge. That concludes my staff report. Turn myself off. There we go. Uh, thank you. And Anna, you, you might be a new face for some of us in presentations. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, I am Anna Kaltoff and I'm a transportation planning intern at the RTC. Wonderful. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, go ahead. It's going to be expected to take in on the business says it's informational. Sir, can we get clarification? This is an informational item only. Thank you. <laughs> All right, uh, no further questions? All right, thank you so much for your presentation. And is there any public comment on this item? Seeing none in the room, uh, online, it looks like we have Rebecca Downing. Yes, good morning again, commissioners. Uh, I submitted a written comment regarding the scope, safety, and maintenance for the new pedestrian bridge over Aptos Creek. I hope staff will reconsider these comments before selecting the final design. The Tide Arch Bridge design is highly visible from the surrounding neighborhood and maybe out of place in this setting. Uh, before making a selection, it's important to consider the profile of a bridge that will be in Aptos for a long time. I don't believe the design renderings fully demonstrate the large presence of an arch bridge. If you look at the pictures at the end of my comment, you can see the profiles of the proposed designs next to a current view of from the railroad bridge on historic Aptos Creek Road Bridge. I believe the stress ribbon design more closely matches the current view of the railroad bridge and the original design that was determined to be infeasible. The residents of Aptos will be traveling through this bridge area more frequently than those living outside of Aptos. So 
our opinion should weigh more heavily in the decision. And while the survey results showed more than half the responders stated that they were from the Aptos zip code, the survey is self-reporting and there was no limit to the number of times it could be taken. Um, I appreciate the time and detailed work by Sarah Christensen, the, the uh, the uh, consultants and staff uh, providing us with these two options. And I asked for more deliberation and another look at the stress ribbon design before making a final decision. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments on this item? Okay, seeing none. Right, yes, seeing none. Okay, we will bring this back. Uh, this was just an informational item. Any further discussion? Okay. Yes, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious about the um, comment of the survey being open to be taken multiple mm -hmm. times. Is there anything that the RTC does to prevent this, like uh, one per IP address or anything like that? Um, I think we've tested it. Um, Shannon Munns, our PIO, can confirm, but um, I think you're only allowed to take it once, but potentially more if you have additional devices, but I defer to Shannon if you wanna provide any more clarification on that. Yeah, that's accurate. Um, you can only take it once per IP address. So if somebody wanted to do it on a bunch of different devices, they could potentially, but if they're on that one device, it's gonna pop up saying you've already taken the survey. Perfect, so, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you. Additional questions or comments? Okay. Wonderful. We are going to move on now to item 30, uh, Highway 1 State Park to Bay Porter Auxiliary Lanes and Bus on Shoulder Project Construction Update. Proposed 24-hour closure of Highway 1 for demolition of the Capitola Overcrossing. Thank you, Chair Brown. My name is Sarah Christensen of your staff. I lead the Highway 1 uh, program of projects. Today, uh, we are going to give a little bit more detail about um, what Director Weiss talked about earlier, which is um, one of our larger projects picking up um, the project between State Park Drive and Bay Porter interchanges. It's about three miles long. Um, and that project has been um, slowly kind of picking up over the winter. There's been some clearing and grubbing activities, minor activities, and all of the major work was deferred until now um, when the weather is better and we... Um, have a couple large structures um, as part of this project. As you're aware, the Capitola Avenue overcrossing is being replaced. That's a local roadway overcrossing in Capitola right on the border of um, county and city jurisdiction. Uh, that uh, bridge is being closed to the public on Monday. Uh, the uh, Caltrans team and the Construction contractor are working diligently to prepare for that. Uh, preparations include uh, placing portable, changeable message signs on local roads. Those have been out, um, I believe, as of Monday of this week. Um, so you should see those if you're driving through the area just to get the locals who are actually using those routes um, familiar and um, prepared for this longer term closure. Uh, this bridge will be closed up to 14 months. We're trying uh, very hard to reduce that as much as we can. Um, however, this is a large complex project and um, it's, you know, expect 14 months, please. Uh, so the Capitol Avenue overcrossing demolition is the other part of um, the update. And that is proposed to be a 24 hour closure planned for Saturday, March 23rd, 7 p.m. to Sunday, March 24th, 7 p.m. And the um, contractor is going to take that bridge down in its entirety in one 24-hour uh, window. So the freeway will be closed for 24 hours. Um, and there is uh, going to be a detour. Obviously, you have to exit at... Um, the earlier interchange, so either at Park or at Bay Porter um, and take um, local roads. So the signed detour will be along Soquel Drive. Um, but obviously the locals are going to find their own uh, preferred way to go. So um, let's see here. What else? We included a detour map for the Capitola Avenue longer term um, detour in our staff report as attachment one. 
attachment two is our public outreach plan for uh, all of this work, the two major closure activities that we are uh, preparing for. And this is really just um, meant to be a living document and we're constantly updating it if there's new information or opportunities to um, provide additional outreach becomes available. Uh, we've been working very closely with um, uh, the jurisdiction staff. So city of Capitola, we're working with um, the police folks over there. They're helping us with um, getting the word out to um, schools, uh, first responders, and um, really like our boots on the ground out there. So we appreciate city staff um, very much from Public Works and uh, the police department. And um, we also request... You know, if if the commissioners are you, if you guys have news letters and social media platforms, it would be really helpful to um, have um, this information go out uh, through those channels as well. And then finally, the because this is a major regional, um, you know, closure, uh, and it's on a weekend, we are doing um, outreach throughout. Uh, the surrounding counties, so Monterey County, San Benito County, um, the entire Bay Area. If you have ever driven, you know, throughout the Bay Area, and there's closures of say 680, it's on the changeable message signs. So those changeable message signs, starting as soon as today, um, are going to say, you know, Highway One in Santa Cruz closed on this date. So um, we're doing as much as we can and working with our local and regional um, partners throughout, you know, as far as we can get the word out to um, get people prepared for this. Um, so that that concludes my staff report and I'm here for questions if you have any. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from commissioners? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, uh, uh, you mentioned it, but I just want to clarify because Chair Brown mentioned that there you're also where Capitol is working on Bay. Is it going to be in, in, in the dates? Uh, I wrote it down. That would be a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> in coordination, you know. So, so. Uh, yes, we um, plan to uh, discuss that with city staff and figure out the timing of that and then uh, adjust accordingly. If it's on the detour route, we may need to um, change gears a bit. But yeah. thanks but, for the heads uh, up on that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Brown. Yes. Any additional questions? All right, we will bring this to public comment. Any public comment in the room? Seeing none. Any comments online? I don't see any hands raised. All right, thank you so much. Uh, we'll bring it back. No further comments. We will move on. Uh, our final item today, thank you so much for that report. Our final item today, item 31, consideration and approval of a legal services agreement with Redwood Public Law LLP for continued general counsel services by Steve Mattis and his team of transportation agency attorneys through June 30th, 2025, and approval of an extension of the legal services agreement with Myers-Nave PLC to continue to provide litigation and labor relations services through June 30th, 2025. To my turn. Okay. All right. Hey, commissioners, <laughs> this is an action item and my long title really pretty much said it all. Uh, Mr. Mattis has been acting as our general counsel through our contract with Myers Nave. He and his team are uh, moving to Redwood Public Law. Uh, this item would uh, enter into a contract with Redwood Public Law for those services uh, and also uh, retain certain services at Myers Nave that are uh, primarily litigation and labor relations. Uh, both uh, agreements would go through June, or the end of June, 2025. Uh, staff recommends approval of this item. Well, I'll move thanks. the agenda item. Oh, we have to go okay. to the public. Well, any questions? No questions? Yeah, we'll do uh, public comment. Seeing none in the room, do we have any hands raised online? No? Okay, we'll bring it back to the commission. I think it's uh, important that we continue the services that we have uh, for the individual uh, services that we need as well. So I'd move the item agenda number 31. Second. second. We have a motion and a second. All right. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. That brings us to uh, adjournment. Our next meeting is scheduled for April 4th at 9 a.m. here in the Board of Supervisors Chambers. Thank you all uh, for participating today. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other.
Thank you. Uh, 